Hare Krishna. Welcome back to our discussion today on the Bhagavad Gita. We are in session 21st and we'll be discussing on the topic of vital importance for all of us, that is relationships. Now this topic can be discussed in various ways, but we'll be discussing it in the light of the wisdom of the Gita, especially the point of we discussed about the mind. So how the mind affects our relationships and how we can use that knowledge for improving our relationships. Yes, so this, so let's move ahead. We'll discuss based on 632 in the Gita. This talks about how the topmost yogi sees everyone. So this is Atma upam yena sarvatra samam pashyati yo arjuna sukham va yadiva dukham sa yogi paramo mataha so, Atmau Pamyena Sarvatra, by comparison of oneself with others, Sarvatra, Samam Pashyati, one who sees all living beings to be equal, Yo Arjuna, Sukham Va Yadi Va Dukham, equal in what sense? In what gives them happiness and what causes them distress, Sa Yogi Paramomataha, that Yogi is the topmost Yogi. So, this is a vision of profound empathy. So, empathy is where we see from the other person's perspective and we see the similarity between us and others. So, the process of yoga involves in some ways seclusion and distancing oneself from the world. However, that is not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is to see the connectedness of everyone and that is what this verse is stating that we don't just connect with the ultimate reality, but we connect with others also at a deeper spiritual level. So, we can see how this can this, this insight can be applied in our lives. Let's go ahead. So, we'll discuss these two main questions. Why are relationships so difficult and how can we improve our relationships? Yeah, please go ahead. So, firstly, the relationships become difficult because we base them on the body and the mind. We base them on the attractiveness of the body and the moods of the mind. So, the attractiveness of the body is fairly easy to understand. Whenever we uh, want to form a relationship, we look at people, especially in romantic relationships, appearances matter a lot. But moods here refers not just to the, to the state of, say, sometimes people say we have fallen in love. That means, that there is a state of romantic attraction where we feel, where somebody feels overwhelmingly attracted to someone else. And the same people who feel overwhelmingly attracted and they fight against the world saying that, you know, I can't live without you. And then they, after a few months, when those hormones start drying up, they start seeing the other side of the person and they start thinking, I can't live with you. So the moods keep changing. Now, when we talk about the mind and what all happens in the mind, it is not just the fickleness of the mood that we see. These moods are caused by something deeper. Sometimes the moods just come randomly and go, but the moods are based on our attitudes, our judgments and how they, how our mind plays a big role in either establishing or sabotaging our relationships. We will look at that. So, basically if you look at this now, each of us is a body, mind and soul. So, the person A is on the left, person B is on the right, as per whichever way you are oriented, it may be different. So, now the soul is the essence of who we are. The soul is covered by the mind, the mind is covered by the body in both cases. So, when we relate with each other, it is not we who are directly relating with the other person, it is we through our mind, through our body is relating with the other person who we, we see their body first, then we'll, we get a sense of their mind over a period of time. Sometimes if that person is very, they are very, they wear their emotions on a sleeve, then we can see their emotions from their bodily expressions, their facial expressions. But beyond that, in the mind there are attitudes, there are, there are ways of, different ways of viewing and valuing the world and valuing life and viewing life. So, all that is there in the mind. So, it is our relationships are mediated through our body and our mind and through their body and their mind. 
and <clears throat> the physical aspect of the attraction we will not focus on because we understand at a philosophical level we are not the body and that physical aspect of the attraction which we discussed earlier when we talked about karma and we will talk about it later again when we take up in the 7th chapter but here we will focus on the uh, mental aspect. So generally we often judge each other and how do we judge? We, when we want to interact with someone, often the first thing we look at is what is the position of the person. Position can mean we want to know what is their profession or in the pecking higher, pecking order, where are they. So that creates a particular attitude within us. If, if we know, say if you are going to a class and we know this person is a teacher, then that creates a particular disposition. If we are meeting a particular person and then say we are at a party or a get together, and then we come to know this person is the CEO or this person is the is the boss over here. Then that that our we meet so many people or whoever we meet, we have to form some functional assessment of those people. So first thing that we do is we try to get some information about their position. Then after that we look at their disposition. You know, are they are they very grave or they are cheerful? Are they frowning or are they smiling? What are they doing? We look at their disposition and then beyond that we look at their actions. That Now, by disposition I mean smiling and frowning can be action, can also be actions but habitually what they do. So, we try to we try to understand people's position, we try to understand their disposition then we understand their action. So, if somebody is very grave then we understand okay for this person uh, I need to also be properly grave. You know, suppose sometimes say if we have a program and after the program there is Prasad and then we are sitting with somebody and we are saying the Prasad was wonderful isn't it? And then they say yes. Now the very gravity with which they say yes it is like a conversation ender. Okay, okay. We, we feel as if there is nothing much to talk over there. So basically based on disposition also we decide how much to connect with, not to connect with. Now, among these two if we consider the position and the disposition are not very easily changeable. Yes, if somebody is at a particular position, they may change it but it is not that it changes every day and disposition also most of us have a particular disposition. Some of us are introverts, some of us are extrovert, some of us are task oriented, some of us are more people oriented, whatever. There are very different ways of assessing the disposition of people but this is also not so easily changeable. Now what is changeable is the action. So by looking at the actions of people we try to understand where they are at and sometimes we judge people without getting enough information. We see, see basically when we are talking about the position that is that's something associated with the body, okay, this person in this position, the action is something which is visible, the disposition is something which is inside which we cannot see which we try to infer. Now suppose somebody is very cross, they are sullen, they are snappy uh, or they are snarky and then we start wondering oh, what is wrong with this person. So at that time when we are trying to assess what is wrong, what do we do? Can you go to the next slide? So when people behave in particular ways, I said that action is what is changeable. Now what makes them act in particular ways? So broadly we can say there are three factors. So these correspond with the three levels of being body, mind and soul. The actions might be circumstantial, the actions might be conditional or they might be intentional. So circumstantial means that sometimes people's circumstances are such that so somebody has had a tough day and they have had 15 things going uh, difficult for them or going wrong for them and then we make one small request to them and then they just explode. You know, why are you making, why are you messing with me, why are you making my life difficult, why are you so demanding, why do you nag so much. Now we may think hey this is just a small simple request but what has happened is that we do not know their circumstances, we do not know what all they have gone through on that particular day, what all situation they are in. So now Sometimes situations can provoke us and even good people can behave in terrible ways at times. So sometimes people's actions are just circumstantial. 
and beyond that sometimes some actions are conditional that means that some people may may just speak thoughtlessly insensitively but they are not themselves they don't they are not themselves ru rude in the sense that they don't want to hurt anyone else but then they just speak without thinking now some people speak uh, to express their thoughts and some people speak to discover their thoughts now of course we can we also think by talking but sometimes when we are trying to discover the thoughts if the form is not appropriate then we might speak something which might be quite hurtful so it might be that there's a it's called a slip of the tongue where we we speak some things because that's our conditioning so now the conditioning is present at the level of the mind the circumstances are at the level of the body so when something is conditional that means arising from their conditionings so the conditional i'm not using it as an adjective of condition i'm using the adjective of conditioning so that means it arises from their conditionings when it arises from their conditionings what that means is that that's just the way they are but that doesn't mean necessarily they mean something uh, they, they they are not mean they might be harsh they might be blunt but that doesn't mean that they are mean they don't mean to hurt us now sometimes of course their actions might be intentional they may speak certain things just to hurt us they just want to provoke us make us angry and and then they might want to incite us and then they they want to exploit that incitement in some way whatever it is so now whenever people behave in particular ways what happens is, is that we ascribe certain labels to their behavior why are they behaving like this and what happens is that based on the conceptions we have about them Uh, we ascribe certain behavior so now when when i'm talking about people's actions it also applies to our actions so these three factors apply to our actions also sometimes we do certain things because of circumstances so sometimes it's our conditioning which makes us do certain things and sometimes it's we intend we are just so angry with someone that we want to hurt them so we deliberately speak in provoking or inciting or infuriating ways now in this case what exactly is going on what is going on is that we are striving to understand what makes relationships difficult so what happens is say if, suppose we see somebody sleeping for a long time and then we may say oh this person is so lazy now generally if we dislike someone we ascribe a negative attribute to their behavior so if we don't like someone we'll say this person is sleeping so much must be must be lazy or if we like someone and they are sleeping a lot we may say oh must be tired or maybe sick if somebody is eating a lot and we don't like them we will say this person is a glutton what how much does he eat on the other hand if we like someone and we see them eating a lot we may say oh must have been hungry maybe they didn't eat a previous meal or whatever so what happens we give the benefit of the doubt when we like someone and we label negatively when we don't like someone and these labels or this this kind of dispositions that we have inside us we are often not aware of them so when we are relating with others we are here the other person is here now their actions why they are doing their actions we don't know and how our response our reactions are emerging that also we don't know unless we introspect and analyze if we so because it's our mind and their mind interacting with each other and our mind is a mess in some ways their mind is a mess in some ways our mind operates uh, on its auto mode we remember earlier we discussed about pop up windows the pop up windows are not just for Uh, how certain sense objects may distract us those pop up windows may also give us opinions about how others are so we fix labels on them this person is lazy this person insensitive this person arrogant this person is uh, <clears throat> is envious this person is like that that person like that we often 
affix labels on people and so what happens when we are affix those labels say for example now if so this is a tablet I have now if this tablet is here I can see the tablet and I can see your phone I can uh, see the screen but now suppose I bring this tablet closer and closer and closer and closer to me the closer it is to me all I can see is the tablet I can't see anything else so similarly for us our mind has certain conceptions now to the extent we understand and remember that we are different from the mind to that extent we can distance the mind's conceptions okay as soon as I see so, so there are some people as soon as we see them we start feeling annoyed with them now they, they don't have to do anything they just have to exist to they just have to come in our presence to make us annoyed or they don't even have to come in our presence they just have to come in our thoughts and we start getting annoyed with them so now what has happened that annoyance is like a pop-up window that has come and then that pop-up window can consume the whole screen so I'm using a different metaphor it's like okay if I know that my mind is different then I can see this is okay this is what has popped up over here but then I can evaluate is this right or wrong but if I don't do that then it pops up and it just consumes my screen so the closer it is to me the less I can see anything except this now this might completely blind me or if this is a colored glass then I can see but I can see through the glass and everything that I see will be colored according to the color of the glass so that's how it is our conceptions of others that are shaped and the more we are attached to our mind generally we talk about we are attached to our sense objects we are attached to various things in the world but the more we are attached to our mind that means the more we identify with our mind the more we take the mind's opinions as our opinions then what happens that is the filter through which we operate with others and then it becomes very difficult for us to connect with others as human beings we basically connect with them as the labels that we have affixed on them so <clears throat> to the extent our mind is calm it is controlled to that extent we can distance ourselves from it we can we can note whatever has popped up over there we don't reject that opinion but we don't immediately accept that opinion and let that become a permanent label by which we see them see the other person so now this is why relationships are difficult that our mind comes in the way and our mind shapes our perception of others and based on that perception when we act then sometimes we react and we we act in a way that alienate others and they also have their mind and their mind impels them to see and act in particular ways and thus uh, the two minds come in conflict with each other and it can lead to a big explosion so how can we how can we improve our relationships I, here I use the word how can I improve my relationships because it's very relation improving relationships is very much an individual activity even if two people are in a relationship we can't change the other person much now we may instruct them we may chastise them we may warn them but none of these really uh, will change that person unless they feel inspired from within to change and so so in a relationship what can we do either we can change ourselves we can change our vision of how we look at them or we can change our interaction with them how we speak with them how we deal with them so how how they act is not in our control uh, who they are is not in our control how they view us is not in our control so basically if you consider the world there are the jnana indriyas through which we take in information and karma indriyas through which we act so the knowledge acquiring senses and the working senses so what what is in our control is how we are so maybe we are in disposition we can change a little bit but beyond that how we see others we can change it that means how we take in information uh, from our jnana indriyas which from our knowledge acquiring senses which come through our mind we can change that and how we act we can change that and we can hope and pray that this will have a positive influence and it will change the other person also and it does it can have a significant influence but by clearly understanding what we what is in our control and what is not in our control we can start so now for the shaping of our actions our perceptions our responses and ourselves 
we need to manage our mind can we go ahead so let's look at how we can improve our relationships so the first thing is mind your mind before you mind other people's mind that means other people's mind means you know, now if somebody is lazy somebody is forgetful somebody is irresponsible somebody is untidy uh, <clears throat> whatever it is somebody is short tempered now why where is it it is not the soul has any of these negative attributes it is the mind over there and when we are trying to correct them you know don't be so lazy why are you so forgetful why can't you be clean and tidy neat and tidy and when we speak like this what are we trying to do we are trying to mind their mind and actually it is very difficult to mind anyone else's mind first we need to mind our mind mind our mind means you know am i just assigning these labels and reducing the person to this label and not seeing any good in the other person except uh, what my the filter of my filter of my mind shows so sometimes what happens when we when we have developed a particular opinion about a person whenever we have formed a particular label then whatever they do which is good we just uh, downplay it and then whatever they do that if we have formed a negative label for them then if they do something which is good we say oh this is just for show or this is just temporary let's see how long this is going to last this is not the real person this is just the pr person and this is the public relationships uh, image of the person but the real person i know who, who they are so what happens we downplay whatever is opposed to the image that on the label that we have formed and we highlight and magnify whenever they act according to the label that we have assigned so this is a universal psychological flaw and this applies everywhere even, even in a field which is supposed to be as objective as science it is said that in science the theories we like we call them facts the facts we don't like we call them theories so the behaviors that are in har that at har that differ from our label we call them just a show and uh, the the behaviors that are in accordance with the label we say this is the real person so that's how we need to recognize the labels that we are putting on people we mean to mind our mind before we can mind other people's mind can you go ahead so what does this mean actually if we understand atma upamyena sarvatra this word said that we are all fighting the same battle samam pashyati yo arjuna see everyone equally see everyone equally means that we are all fighting against our own minds even when we are fighting with each other we may be quarreling we may be fighting yelling whatever but actually it is you know they have a mind that is uncontrolled we have a mind that is uncontrolled so we are actually fighting against, the real fight is not between us and them the real fight is between us and our mind and them and their mind now this is not to say that there can't be genuine differences which need to be resolved but i am talking about first fight is between us and our mind not between us and them so we our focus should be not on seeing through people seeing through people means that you know we oh you are acting this way but this is not the way you are actually that is the other way you are so you are acting very nice and polite and friendly but this is not the way you are so focus not on we not on seeing pe- through people but on seeing people through seeing people through means that life is a tough journey and we are all in one sense colleagues or comrades in a battle against the forces of illusion against the mind and we want to hold each other's hands and we want to help each other move through this troubled troubled world that we are in can you go ahead so now so what does seeing through each other means labeling others behavior and then dismissing them so for example if somebody has been in the past untidy and then we see that they are little tidy now and we say oh let's see so this is just for show you are not going to reform so we dismiss their actions even when they are good and seeing each other through means as i said help each other deal with our minds so till now i talked about um how we need to mind our mind first but then what okay i try to avoid labeling the other person i try to understand my default ways of looking i try to change that but then what about the practical situation it is difficult what do i do with that so for that we need, we can say there are three broad ways of relating with each other 
So later on we'll talk about the three modes of material nature in the 14th chapter. But broadly speaking, this is, this is related to the three modes. If we are, we can be assertive, we can be aggressive, we can be passive. So passive is in the mode of ignorance, aggressive is in the mode of passion, assertive is in the mode of goodness. So passive means that we let just we let other people walk over us. That means we have no space left. Whenever there is a whenever there is a difference of opinion, whenever there is an argument, whenever there is a conflict, we just we just cave in. Okay, let let it be your way. So now and sometimes you might think this is okay. I'm being humble. Well. Humility is a big subject and we will come to it, but humility does not mean passivity or lethargy or weakness or uh, letting ourselves be exploited. Humility basically means we do not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Uh, that means that, oh, because you did not respect me, so I am going to hit back at you and I am going to disrespect you and I am going to humiliate you and I am going to hurt you. No, that, okay, my purpose is to do this, this, this and if even if you don't disrespect, even if you disrespect me, but if I can pursue my purpose, then I won't take the disrespect so seriously. So humility basically means to not be too respect-centric, to be too respect-conscious, too honor-conscious. So humility doesn't mean passivity. Now aggressive, so passive means, see in each relationship, we all need our space. Space refers not just to the physical space. Now. <clears throat> because of social distancing there is physical space between people but uh, space does not refer only to physical space it refers also it refers primarily to uh, for us some space by which we can we can live life in a way that is in harmony with our mind our body now we do not want to li uh, live for our mind or our body we do not want to live against our mind or our body but we have to live with our mind and our body so that means space means what if somebody is say an introvert now introverts also like people but they just like people in moderation in moderation and with intermission that means a person who is an introvert they don't want to keep meeting people from morning to night continuously and even if they meet okay for some time we'll meet we'll talk and then okay then i need a little break then i'll meet introverts are people who say they get strength when they are alone through their introspection, with their thoughts. Extroverts are people who get strength by being with others. They just can't be alone. They just want to be with someone, talk with someone. Even if they have nothing to do, they will pick up a phone and they will call someone, they will chat, send a message to someone. They, if they are alone, they will do that by default. So now, so for a person who is extrovert, if they are, they are say calling someone, chatting someone, why can't you sit down and be peaceful? or somebody is an introvert, you know, why do you want to go alone and be alone in a room? You can't you sit and talk with me? You know, everybody needs their space. So space means we are talking about how we can be ourselves. Now if somebody can be an extreme introvert and they say I will never talk with anyone. Uh, well, or they are rude whenever they talk, that is not healthy. But we need to, the body and mind is like a machine and we need to make sure that the machine works well. So whatever it takes for that. So our space means to be in harmony with our mind and body. So we need that space otherwise we can't function effectively. So assertive means that we, we seek our space while also giving others their space. If you are aggressive that means we just encroach in other people's space. That means we just control them, dominate them, micromanage them and we expect them to do nothing except whatever we tell them to do. We don't allow them to be their own person. So we would like to be assertive. Now being both aggressive and passive result from the conditioning of the mind. A mind that is, a mind that thinks that oh, I am meant to control everything that will go into aggressiveness. That means the, this, the aggressive mind wants to mold others it sees others simply like a moldable clay and thinks that I will make them into a particular shape. The, the passive mind thinks that actually others are just like a juggernaut, an irrepressible force, like a boulder they are going to roll over me and I can't do anything about it. But assertive means that we understand 
this is the space I need and this is the space you need. So we give each other the space. Space means it can also be space for errors, space for our conditionings that this when I do it, yeah, maybe I will, uh, this is how I am and for even if I have to improve it, it is going to take me some time to improve this. And same way, we are patient with others when they have some limitations, they do certain things in a way different from the way we do those things. So basically we need to be, we need to learn to be assertive in our relationships. And assertiveness is possible when we understand the genuine needs of our body and mind. Not that we pander to every demand of the body and every demand of the mind. So again, to the extent we have some amount of self-mastery at least, some amount, some, at least to some amount we understand how our mind works, then we can actually uh, distance ourselves from it and learn to be assertive. Now this brings us to the last part of the talk that we have two kinds of relationships. We have horizontal relationship with others and we have vertical relationship with Krishna. Uh, this means that while we are relating with each other in the world, uh, we, the, all the relationships that we have have their own particular importance. Some are extremely important, some are fairly important, some are not that important. But whatever the relationships we have, they are horizontal in the sense that they are also with other people, they are also souls who are like, like us. Our, our primary eternal relationship is with Krishna. And Krishna is present within our hearts and he is always with us. So we all need to connect with him. Bhakti Yoga is the process of connecting with Krishna first and foremost. And when we connect with him, that connection gives us some satisfaction, some strength. And so if in a horizontal relationship there are some turbulences, say the other person starts behaving in an unreasonable way, or sometimes we make a mistake and they they make a further mistake, they make a further uh, mistake and things start getting aggravated. So then we need some connection that will stabilize us. So our Krishna connection is meant to be like a stabilizer, be like an anchor. So in the stormy waves of the world where uh, we and others will be tossed about by our mind sometimes, if we are connected with Krishna, that can stabilize us. And that relationship is our, when we stay connected with Krishna, then what happens? Even we are not so dependent on others. Some people are extremely emotionally needy, the clingy kind of people. And for such people, if the other person just speaks one wrong word, then they, for them it's like a catastrophe. What happened? What did you do? Why did you speak like that? So, oh. Uh, we can't, we want, we want to be connected with each other, but we can't be excessively dependent on anyone. We want to be, we want to be steady and stable ourselves. So that connection with Krishna can stabilize us. And ideally speaking, the horizontal and the vertical relationships work symbiotically. That means by our, by our practice of bhakti, by our inner connection with Krishna, by our, uh, we get some stability, some uh, and then we don't overreact to others occasional lapses and we are able to tolerate and uh, connect with them better and secondly if they are also connected with Krishna then uh, they are also spiritually inclined spiritually favorable then what happens their connection with Krishna also inspire helps them to calm down helps them to stay stable and then uh, their connection with Krishna also inspires us to connect with Krishna better so basically the the principles of bhakti, our understanding our own body, mind and soul can help us to connect with each other better. But our connect, understanding our connection with Krishna will help us to stabilize ourselves. Or not just understanding but developing that relationship with Krishna. And we conclude with one last point that our purpose of all our relationships is not material gratification. It is spiritual evolution. What does that mean? Material gratification means that we think how much pleasure this person is going to give me or how much trouble this person is causing me. And then when there is that attitude, if we start feeling that the pleasure is less than the trouble in this relationship, then we start thinking, what is the point of this relationship? Maybe I should just break this. But if we understand 
that our relationships are meant for spiritual evolution. Spiritual evolution means that by connecting with this person, by this relationship, maybe we grow in humility, we grow in tolerance, we grow in emotional, emotional resilience, emotional maturity and that these are virtues that can help us connect with Krishna also. It's very easy to be humble with those who are humble. But those who are not humble, they often force us to become humble. Because they, they, they behave in such ways that if we just give in to our ego or our anger, we won't be able to function with them. So, sometimes the, a particular relationship horizontally might be frustrating, but if that is helping us to grow as a person, then that is a worthwhile, that is, that, that is worthwhile. So, broadly speaking, material consciousness and spiritual consciousness with respect to relationships is that when we are in material consciousness, as soon as we see a person, the first thought that comes in our mind is, what can this person do for me? On the other hand, when we are in spiritual consciousness, the first thought is, what can I do for this person? So, what can I do for this person? And that spiritual evolution means whatever, however this person is right now, you know, it's an opportunity for me to serve, to contribute and not just serve this person, I'm serving Krishna through this person. How? Because they are also parts of Krishna and I am placed in the situation by Krishna's arrangement. So, sometimes we serve the other person or sometimes we just serve Krishna through the other person. Even if that other person is not really... Uh, spiritual or inclined uh, or even favorably inclined toward us, but we tolerate them so that we can serve Krishna. Suppose a, a person is selling, person is at the, in a say a cloth shop where that person is showing clothes to uh, the various customers who come. Now some customers they just look at 100 clothes or and then they don't buy anything. And especially if there are like traditional clothes, like if there is a sari or something, you now they want to unwind it and see it and then the person has to wind it and keep it again. They might get irritated, you know, you look at so many and you didn't buy, buy anything. So, sometimes some customers who are very picky, who are very fastidious, very um, annoying, normally if a customer comes into a shop, various attendants will want to attend to that person. But some attendance, sometimes some customers come and all the attendance just go away from that person. So now, this suppose an attendant is attending to such a troublesome customer and then while they are attending to that customer, we find that the person is just nagging and complaining and uh, being a very, being as in today's parlance, something like being a jerk. Now we may feel that, we may feel like, the attendant might feel like exploding at the person. But if the attendant knows, that, okay, there are CCTV cameras over here and my boss is watching. And my salary is going to come from my boss. Now, the person will be as courteous as possible. The attendant is as courteous as possible. And sometimes the, the person may still not buy, still might get into a snitch and just go, go away from there. Now, if the boss is wise, the boss is mature and the boss will say, hey, you know, that is a tough customer. But you dealt with them quite politely. You know how to deal with tough guys. Okay, now you take care of the whole wing and you train others how to take care of the customers, how to take care of tough customers. So, what happened here? At an external level, this person couldn't make the sale. So, you could say he failed. At one level, he failed. But at another level, he pleased the, the attendant pleased the uh, boss and the attendant succeeded. So, got a raise, got a, got a promotion. So, like that, sometimes in some relationships, no matter what we do, we just don't seem to make, be making any headway. But if we have just a reductionistic view of this relationship, no, I am relating with you, you are relating with me. You are, not, you are not polite with me, why should I be polite with you? If we have a reductionistic view, then it's very easy to just, uh, just uh, break the relationship. But if we see that actually Krishna is present in my heart, Krishna doesn't need any CCTV camera to watch. If Krishna sees that I am staying humble, I am staying polite, I am trying to be tolerant, then Krishna will appreciate that. And Krishna will help us grow spiritually. 
so we may not never have a deep connection with that person but in trying to connect with that person with 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 a virtuous way the courteous way then we will connect deeper with krishna so in that sense if we keep the purpose of spiritual evolution in mind and not material gratification we can even navigate difficult relationships without increasing the difficulties that we face and in that way by connecting with krishna we can fulfill our life's ultimate purpose not just by the direct practices of bhakti that we do but also by the way we interact with each other so i'll summarize what i spoke today mm. i spoke today on the topic of why are relationships difficult and how can we improve them so relationships are difficult because they are filtered through our mind our body and their mind their body so we for interacting with people we have to have some functional assessment of them we assess them based on their their position their disposition their actions when we see their actions often we uh, we ascribe the actions might be because of their circumstances because of their conditionings or because of their intentions but often based on the kind of label we have assigned to them we give them we ascribe certain motivations for their actions so people we like we give them positive we give them the benefit of doubt if they do something bad but people we don't like we just immediately label them negatively and reinforce that label so how can we improve our relationships i said we need to mind our mind before we mind their mind that means we need to this i talked about how the tablet is close to my eyes i can't see anything except the tablet so like that if we are if we are too attached to our own mind our opinions then we don't let we don't see the reality as it is so we distance ourselves and try to give the other person the benefit of doubt give them a fair hearing in any relationship we can't control the other person's behavior we can change ourselves we can change our vision of them and we can change our interaction with them so then i talked about the <coughs> when we in this way learn some mature learn to become mature we have a fair chance of influencing them positively and thereby making the relationship pause better so don't see through others see others through rather than think that i am fighting against them he says we are fighting against i am fighting against my mind they are fighting against their mind and actually we are in the same fight we are not fighting with each other we are in the same boat and our connection with krishna can stabilize us so that we can face the storms in various relationships better our purpose in relationships is not material gratification but spiritual evolution that means we don't think what is this person doing for me so much as we think of what can i do for this person and i concluded by the example of the attendant that sometimes we might not be able to make the sale we might not be able to connect but well with the other person but we may we may please krishna if we remain courteous and that way we can go closer to krishna not just through how we practice direct devotional activities but also how we interact with each other so thank you very much there are quite a few questions hmm now the first question about self is uh, how we are more empathic towards others than ourselves that's a big subject and i'll cover this in a future session but briefly if we can't love krishna without loving the parts of krishna and the part of krishna for which we are most responsible the part of krishna over which we have the most control is we ourselves so if we are not encouraging and empathic toward ourselves if we are not uh, having respect and love for ourselves then we are actually disrespecting a part of krishna so our love for krishna will be inadequate if we can't love ourselves now loving ourselves is not in a narcissistic way and see how i am so great and we are obsessed with ourselves but understanding that we are also parts of krishna and therefore we need to be empathic with ourselves also <clears throat> now how exactly to do that we'll have to specifically based on context sometimes we need to be hard with ourselves sometimes we need to be gentle with ourselves basically the idea is we should to always stay encouraged and connected with krishna and we should be able to move forward purposefully in our life and for that whatever required we deal with ourselves in that way so 
if if somebody in a position of responsibility like a parent and a child or a teacher and a student and they meant to mind other person's mind if you are impart good values yes i didn't say that we can't mind other people's mind i said mind your mind before you mind other person's mind yes in some relationships we do have to shape others but you know even children are not simply like uh, wet clay that's one metaphor which is used sometimes but uh, possibly another, another metaphor is that children are like garden seeds the seed is there what we have to do is just bring the seed out another metaphor could be like you know, children are like car drivers they have a particular car which is somewhat similar somewhat different from ours so they have to learn to manage their car but the basic driving skills we have to give them so the idea is that we have to mind our mind even when dealing with children in fact especially uh, when people get married and they the the real miracle is not that parents have that adults have children that adults make children but the real miracle is that children make adults that means in dealing with children adults have to become more mature more responsible uh, and learn to rein in their impulses their moods so yes if we if say for example if we are taking care of a child and if we don't mind our mind then then we won't be able to be good parents we will will become very judgmental and then when we, maybe when the children are small we will be able to control them but as they grow older they will just rebel and they will go away from us so we need to mind our mind so that we can mind their mind yes certainly we have to impart some values to them and we have to tell them if some of the third things are wrong but that we can do it in a way that we don't we don't uh, blame them we also need to first of all see that there be there any misbehavior is coming from the mind and not from the soul and we need to help them to catch their mind in action and then correct it so if we start labeling them then the problem becomes that that label becomes the central defining thing in the relationship and that is problematic so if we help them to see if we see them as different from their mind and help them to see that they are different from their mind then we can equip them to deal with their issues okay so how can i serve selflessly even if the other is mistreating or without being affected by their behavior no i didn't say that we tolerate mistreat or abuse i talked about being assertive not and not being passive also so in general if we consider broad civilizational ethos we have western civilization we have indian civilization or eastern civilization in eastern the emphasis is more on tolerance hmm? so in you know, their difficulty just tolerate in some ways people are passive in the west often people are aggressive how dare you spoke like speak like this to me who do you think you are get out of my life so neither of these is very healthy ideally speaking we need to be assertive and how exactly to do that we will have to we will have to find out ourselves that means basically if the other person is completely dominating our minds when they are there when they are not there naturally if you are in a close relationship we need to be we need to think about other person and we need to shape our life and our actions based on their actions also what their preferences their their act, them to some extent but if we are constantly obsessed conscious of that person or conscious is dominated by that person and dominated in an unpleasant way where we are constantly fearful oh, if i do this this will happen if i do this they will get angry with this then we feel choked by that and that is unhealthy now how exactly we create space for ourselves that we have to be uh, that we have to be thoughtful we have to be resourceful we may have to consult some other uh, guides or friends and with that we can create some space for ourselves but we do need, we, it's not that we let the other person be abusive and uh, we just uh, passively take it no that will that will not be good because then they will abuse not only us they will abuse others also and that is not good for them that is not good for us
So, if somebody is in leadership position, how should they judge others without becoming judgmental? Say, if somebody hmm, charges devotees more and the devotees are simple and they don't realize it, well, that's a very specific situation. If we are in leadership position, at least at a functional level, we need to make some assessments. So basically, we can make judgments, but don't be judgmental. The difference is that being judgmental means it's almost like a permanent label we have fixed on the other person. Uh, but judgments means functionally, okay, I understand it's a good devotee. At the same time, then they can't do this particular service well. So if somebody is very forgetful, and if we put them in a service which requires a great amount of remembrance and uh, precision, then that's something which we, we shouldn't be doing. So now if some, if for example, somebody is cheating, then, <coughs> then in some ways, if we are in leadership position, we have to alert. Either we have to warn that person or we have to alert other devotees. We don't want to spoil the reputation of that person also. But yes, corrective action needs to be taken. And that's why being in leadership position is especially difficult because uh, you know, we don't want to hurt anyone, but sometimes the responsibilities means that we have to take certain decisions. So it's a challenge if we do it in a prayerful attitude. Generally, uh, if uh, it's said that we appreciate in public and correct in private. So if we mention it in a discreet way, then quite often it is possible that you can deal with that issue without it inflaming too much. If I'm, if I'm an introvert and I find it difficult to start conversation and make contacts, well then you don't have to make more contacts, you can make deeper contacts with whoever you are already connected with. So focus on that and then uh, that, that will give us the emotional strength, the emotional nourishment. So for all of us, there are certain interactions which give strength and certain interactions which take strength. So even as introverts, we might have, we might be just, our wavelengths might match with one or two people. And if they are there, then we should go out of our way to spend time and connect with them. And those interactions will give us strength. And then with that strength, we can go and interact with other people also. So we can decide, okay, I, won't, I don't necessarily have to talk with every single person I meet. And, but we can decide, maybe I can just go a little bit out of my comfort zone. So make sure that we are nourished and then stretch yourself. If you are already famished, you are already empty and, and then we try to do something which exhausts us, it will not be possible. Okay, I'll just, um, how to deal with possessive people? That's why I said that. We need to be assertive. Now they may think that we are not capable to confront them. Well, then they have to change. We have to, by our actions, help them change their conception. See, we, if we don't stand up in the world, we will be trampled. It's as simple as that. Uh, now, sometimes we may say that in a particular relationship or a particular uh, particular area, if that area is not important for me, I don't mind being trampled. Also, that's okay. Because if we have to consider what is the important thing in my life, what is my purpose, purpose provides perspective. So if something is really interfering strongly with my purpose, then we have to take a stand. But if some things are small and that person is domin is possessive, but you know, they are not really controlling a major part of my life, then I don't have to confront them. But otherwise, we need to create space for ourselves. If we don't, then we will be choked and what happens is, Anger that you know, whenever there is a negative emotion toward others, when negative emotion comes out, it becomes anger, but when it doesn't come out, it becomes hatred, and that hatred when it explodes, it's very ugly. So, we need to we need to vent our emotions and create some space for ourselves. We can't tolerate infinitely. If we are forced to, then we will explode, and the explosion will be will be can be horrifying. In the work world, we have to associate people whose values don't align with us, which relationship make us unco uncomfortable, how to deal with such situations without becoming miserable. We'll try to find out what we align with. 
Sometimes as devotees, we become very judgmental toward those who are different from us. Say, so, okay, somebody may eat meat or somebody may have some other habits. But people, we don't have to reduce them to their particular, per, uh, particular uh, mismatched value. Yeah, you know, somebody can be having a particular one or two or three, whatever behaviors. But otherwise, they might be, they might be polite, they might be helpful, whatever it is. Look for virtues. One quality of the godly Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in 16.2 is apaishunam. Apaishunam means aversion to fault finding. So, if we have to work with people, then focus on uh, the focus on the similarities, not on the differences. And give them their space. This is a big subject, but I'll, maybe I'll quickly explain this. See, I talk about this horizontal and vertical relationships. So, we have our relationship with Krishna. We have our relationship with them and they have their relationship with Krishna. And sometimes we try to evaluate them based on their relationship with Krishna and maybe try to push them too much to go toward Krishna or condemn them because they are not going toward Krishna. Yes, we would like them to also be devotionally disposed, but if they are not, if they are sensually disposed or whatever, you know, we can have, if we don't have this, as I said, concord or symphony, uh, concord or uh, symbiotic relationship, we can have compartmentalize. You know, my most important relationship is my relationship with Krishna. And if you start, if they start imposing on us, you know, you, you, you drink wine or do this or do that, we may say no firmly to that. But after our relationship with Krishna is stable, we can focus on our relationship with them, not on their attitude toward Krishna. Make, the th make A, B, C and as three separate things. So, if we do it that way, then we can relate with others at a functional level. And uh, we don't have to impose, worry about their relationship with Krishna or if we have our space, then what they are doing in their personal space, it doesn't have to matter so much to us. Yeah, I think the last question I already answered. If somebody cheats or misbehaves, we have to create space for ourselves. Now, we don't have to label them negatively. That will happen if we have not expressed ourselves, then the anger will go inside, become hatred, it will become a permanent label. But we can we can take a stand, maybe inform some senior devotees who can help us take that stand practically. But being assertive is what is required if we want to have a sustainable connection in a community. If we can be passive for some time, but eventually we will feel choked and repressed. So, we need to stand up for ourselves. As far as maintaining a good relationship with that person, different relationships work well at different distances. Some relationships work well very closely, some relationships work uh, best somewhat remotely. So, we can respect them from a distance and not interact with them much. That is also one way of maintaining a good relationship. So, we have to see what works best for us and for them. And then appropriately, uh, and then appropriately um, moderate that relationship. So, thank you very much. Hare Krishna.